Hello everyone, uh, I am Yatasha Sidian. I've recently submitted my MPhil dissertation to the University of Delhi and today I will be presenting a paper titled The Indenture Legacy Reconfiguring Identity in Mauritius. The history of Mauritius can be read under the headings of slavery, indentured labor and settlement following various waves of immigration from Europe, Africa, and Asia, Indian immigrants constitute a major part of the island whose cultural visibility is still very much prominent in Mauritius today. In the wake of diasporic consciousness, social identity and ethnicity have assumed a substantial significance as we discuss cultural revolution and identity in a pluralistic country like Mauritius. Since independence, there have been many debates as to what exactly constitutes the Mauritian identity. Efforts to promote the representation of minorities, building off of colonial era racial classifications, has led to divisive politics in recent decades. Concerns about the dominance of the islands into majority has led the Creole or the Muslim population and other minorities to foster their own collective identities, further politicizing religion. As many indentured immigrants look back to their homeland to preserve their religious and social identity, the younger generations are seen to be forming their own new identity, perhaps the Mauritian identity. However, the dark history of, of immigration still haunts Mauritius as descendants of the displaced continue to look back to their homeland. The sinister history of migration traces the legacy of bondage, uprooting and loss of homeland of the Indian immigrants, also called as Girmitias, brought from different parts of India, notably from Bihar, Kolkata, Bombay and South India. It is in this backdrop that my paper analyzes the concept of Hindu identity formation and community building of the indentured population of Mauritius. This paper investigates the issues of identity of Indian indentures and their descendants, now who we can call Mauritians, through an examination of the articulation of a literary work of a Mauritian writer who helps in reshaping and understanding the diasporic consciousness or the diasporic sensibility among the indentured laborers. The text that others might live by Deep Chan C. Biari, written in, the, uh, in, written in 1976, belongs to a literature classified as a diasporic text which merges history and geography in a chain of interconnected narratives that bear history, that bear testimony to the traumatic experiences of the immigrants. This text elucidates the preservation of the historical specificities, which act as a catalyst for the Mauritian readers in rekindling the memories of their ancestors and for a larger audience to situate these narratives through the prism of diaspora and form their own identity. The narratives of the displaced and their collective determination are activated, if not reactivated. The shared idea of displacement furthers the memories of the descendants of the immigrants, which includes preserving one's identity and culture, but the memory of home is salient. Preservation of identity has been a, a focal point in the lives of immigrants, both in the colonial and post-colonial setup. The setting of this novel emphasizes the way immigrants have been alienated from their surroundings, which subsequently contributed to the disintegration of their identities. It is through half-remembered traditions and associations of the others, of the elders who had a knowledge of the Hindu religion, that many were able to reconfigure their identities. Proposing new perspectives on a fascinating yet inadequate representation of the indentured laborers, this paper will primarily look into the construction and preservation of their identity in an alleged rainbow nation. Of late, identity and home have become subjects of serious debate and discussion since the second half of the 20th century. Contemporary discourses on diaspora, post-colonial theory, and cultural studies have added new dimensions to these key concepts. According to Brubaker, diaspora is a way of formulating the identities and loyalties of the population. 
the process of migration and settlement of Indians and the challenges they face in the host country help them form a diaspora consciousness, which help them also shape the island with a hard work, but preserve the ethnic identity and ancestral values side by side. When the immigrants left for India, they had brought along with them their culture, religion, and language. Many had carried with them their religious books like the Gita, the Ramayana, and the Quran. The visibility and presence of the diasporic consciousness is very much felt through the younger generations today, either through their customs or through the propagation of the ancestral language, Hindi. A language mostly referred to as Oriental language and which is taught in many schools today. Biarri's novel is preoccupied with the search of identity, the trauma of displacement and the dilemma of home and homeland in his migrant characters, Thirain and Manish. Though the novel focuses on the Hindu community of India, the society it depicts involves a large part of the colonized island. While living in a colonial setting, the immigrants characterized in the novel constantly struggle to claim their identity, which is linked to the question of their survival because they held great importance to their religion, which we see constitute their identity even in present times. The isolation and frustration of the immigrants, the need to hold on to their own traditional culture and Hindu norms, are important elements of the novel. For instance, Dhiren's reluctance reluctance to wear western clothes such as a pant and a shirt or to marry someone of a different origin all of these together reveals his own struggle to preserve his identity it is important to note how clothing has been an important form of representing one's culture and speaking of today we see that clothing can act as a symbol of preserving one's identity so if we uh, analyze, we see that clothing demarcates one's ethnic or religious identity from another. In Mauritius, a tangible mark of difference between a Hindu and a non-Hindu woman is the practice of wearing a sari. Wearing the sari or ethnic clothes like kurta, pajamas, has been an integral part of Hindu identity and practice, although its form has undergone change from one generation to another. Their religious practice of, big, of going to religious institutions in ethnic clothes has played a de decisive role in the immigrants' lives, strengthen, strengthening their commitment to their religious practice. If ethnic clothes have become a fashion statement, they have also acted as a demarcation of different cultural groups of the Mauritian population. According to Berry, cultural groups exist as long as they are seen as others and as long as they engage in the labor of identity construction and cultural maintenance, resisting pressure to assimilate. The segregation among the Hindus has been prominent in colonial time as much as in the present day. Cultural and religious groups were formed according to their geographical locations, heritage, and shared linguistic ties. The religious divisions exacerbated by different waves of immigration has caused Indians to identify more strongly along religious lines. <clears throat> For example, Mauritian Hinduism can be understood in terms of Hindi speakers and non-Hindi speakers. Immigrants who spoke Hindi and Bhojpuri were considered to be Hindus, while those who would speak Tamil, Telugu, and Marathi had their respective culture and religion but were not considered as hindu it is intriguing to see how hindi speaking hindus have monopolized the term hinduism in mauritius despite sharing the common ancestry of the hindu culture today in mauritius hindus who speak hindi are commonly referred to as malba telugu speakers as telugus tamil speakers as tamuls urdu speakers as musulman if these languages have segregated and helped form different cultural and religious groups, the shared mother tongue Creole has been one of the markers of a collective Mauritian identity, which unifies and brings all the cultures under one umbrella. As we look back to Biari's novel, Ghosh Babu, a secondary character, expresses his concern of losing touch with the religion and culture. He believes that if the Hindus lose their culture, their identity will be endangered. 
and their lives would be rendered meaningless. That is why he believes that the immigrants must associate with each other and promote the Brahmo Samaj. He goes on to say, life was a torture for the people, but we managed to keep the lamp of our culture burning. The missionaries had have not been able to do much and they tried once or one once or twice to convert me but after a discussion they kindly left me alone close quote from biarist novel ghost babu's refusal to comply and adopt the western values is an act of cultural resistance paralleling the concept of boundary maintenance Furthermore, we see that association with other cultures makes immigration more painful, as it may challenge the uniqueness of all races and groups. Therefore, the association and the interaction with other immigrants of the same cultural group felt necessary for the protagonists not only to fight loneliness, but to help preserve their identity. The construction of temples and small schools had an active hand in promoting the ancestral language and religion. Sukhyada, an old immigrant, believes that in a country where most of the immigrants are compelled to fight for existence, the propagation of culture is only possible in temples and small schools in the village. He had retained his language and religion through the association of the other immigrants who would gather and recite from the sacred books. For example, the opening of the Bedka by Diren Das was a deliberate effort to assimilate to assemble Indians and educate them to bring a sense of solidarity among the Indians. The Bedka was an institution through which Diren perpetuated moral and cultural values and educated the immigrants about hygiene and religion. This practice has been continuing even in present times, except for now, Bedkas have been replaced by Hindi schools on weekends where Hindi lessons are taught. Biari looks concerned with the issues of indentured laborers and their harrowing past experience in Mauritius, but also seems to bring into limelight the sense of solidarity and hard work which harnessed the atrocities of the colonizers to a point that the power relations changed. By 1921, 35% of the land was owned by Indian immigrants. They developed the village system, which can be seen as the primary spatial unit of belonging in the host country. It is through the village system and through the practice ancestral traditions that they were able to maintain their ethnic di divisiveness and identity even in contemporary Mauritius. Unfortunately, at the same time, the village system has been locking homogeneous cultural groups into a mythological setting and isolated it from Creoles or other minority cultures. For example, various villages in Mauritius are either Hindu-centric, while ghettoization of Creoles happen in regions known as Siti. In the homogenized representation of the Indo-Mauritian Hindu community, the Indian immigrants assumes the image of the hero and establishes its position in many indentured-centric narratives. The immigrants' role as passive sufferers to active uh, agents against the colonizers' exploitation can be traced through the character of Dirain, who joins Deplevitz against the domination of the laborers. He, along with his Jahajia Bhais, is portrayed as a hard worker who had a revolutionary mind. The representation of the immigrants as sorry as coolie heroes, heroes and as hard workers also acts as a backbone in contemporary indo mauritian community for those who look back to their ancestors for nation building. The fact that all our prime ministers, except for Mr. Paul Beranger, who was a Franco Mauritian, have been descendants of the Hindu indentured laborers brings us to reflect on the hero on the key coolie heroism, sorry, once again whether Heroic stance has to be undertaken by the Cooley hero. Speaking of Cooley heroism, it is important to highlight Carl Torberly's idea of Cooleytude, a term coined by this Mauritian poet which invokes the idea of Cooley diaspora, where identities of the indentured or transcultural. The term Cooleytude is a combination of the word Cooley with the word Negritude. Cooley today seeks to draw attention to the contributions of mainly Indian indentured laborers to the multicultural makeup of the Indian Ocean and Caribbean societies. Cooley reclaims the indentured 
identity for those with half or no remembered heritage. Torabali believes that the coolie identity is more inclusive and sustainable than the toxic notions of national identity and socioeconomic status. It is more abstract, an identity that is decidedly less concrete. It is a steady struggle to characterize a post-colonial identity for the Métis. This brings us back to the concept of Mauritian identity being a broader quest. It is a pursuit of national identity and a transcendence of the nation-state at the same time, something that the country has struggled with since its inception. Mauritius today has grown to be known as an archetypal independent state nurturing a rainbow nation and nation l'arc-en-ciel. The idea of all coming together as one people, as one nation, as en seul le pep, en seul nation, to celebrate the island and to celebrate their Mauritianism, their perhaps hybrid identities and their unique modes of identification. It is undeniable that to a certain extent, lines of ethnic and cultural differences have become indistinguishable through cultural assimilation, national events, inter-ethnic marriages and post-independence socio-economic relationships, giving Mauritians the appearance of being one people. However, whilst the island's movement to be a stable and successful economy is obvious and observable and is recognized around the globe, the official discourse of a peaceful multi-ethnic space, a unified multicultural nation, proves to be limited. Mauritianism as an identity today can only be interpreted and represented, kept romantic, euphoric, poetic. As many see Mauritianism as the new dis identity of the displaced, many fail to establish what exactly is Mauritianism, a feeble patriotism and nationalism like any other or worse, fascism at an embryonic stage. To sum up, as much as Biari's novel unfolds the need to preserve one's identity, we see how continued legacy of identity preservation during the past decades accentuate along the lines of religion and culture. Hindu Mauritians may draw affirmative emotional consolation and social advantage from asserting a sense of belonging to their own ethnic community. While such an internally comforting sense of affective belonging is simultaneously asserted to the exclusion and detriment of individuals or minority groups who are not included as members of their seemingly homogeneous grouping. However, it would also be right to say that even though some of these ways of identity formation have been appropriated, Hindu Mauritians are not merely limited to an ancestral identity, as diverse forms of belongingness are emerging as an alternate identity. It is also hoped that the eclectic analytical framework developed here when examining diverse ways of identity formation and preservation might be extrapolated to other multi-ethnic situations and so to help recalibrate our understandings of the dynamics of identity and exclusion in diverse cultural societies. With this, I come to an end to my paper. Thank you very much.